strength like no other. Strength like no other. Reach out to me. You are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. Reach out to me. In the fullness of your grace and in the power of your you lift me up, you lift me up, you lift me up, you lift me up in the fullness and in the fullness of your grace. In the power of your name, you lift me up, and I'm mighty grateful, Lord. You lift me up. You are my hope. You are my hope. A hope like no other. A hope like no. Other. Oh, reach out to me. You are, you are my hope. You are my hope. Hope like no other. Hope like no other. Reach out to me. In the fullness of your grace And in the power of your You lift me up, you lift me up Oh, and I'm my grateful Lord You lift me up In the fullness In the fullness of your grace We thank God for the privilege of being together again another Sunday. And today we're looking at the tabernacle, symbol of God's presence. Our text is Exodus chapter 29, verses 43 to 45. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. 
I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. A vital part of a pilot's war train is survival. And pilots face the possibility of being shot by the enemy and having to eject from their airplane. And in many cases, pilots have had to land in a deserted area where they need to know how to survive in a hostile environment. A survival kit is part of a pilot's basic equipment. And God gave Israel the means of survival. The Israelites were destined to wander in the wilderness from Mount Sinai to the land of Canaan for 40 years. They would never have survived the years in the wilderness living that hardship had not God accompanied them and watched over them day and night. The, the tabernacle symbolised survival. And worship is the survival kit for people in the 21st century. It helps us to cope with the stresses of our time. I want us to look at some of the important truths the tabernacle teaches. First of all, the tabernacle, as I said, symbolises God's presence. The word tabernacle means dwelling place. In Hebrew, the word came from a verb that meant to encamp. And the general view of the Old Testament is that the Lord's permanent dwelling place is in heaven, but he tabernacles with people. The portable desert tent known as a tabernacle symbolised God's presence. Now, there are two defective ideas about God that are common among us today. One sees God as the creator of the universe who walked away from his creation. The second view sees God as an occasional visitor. He intervenes from time to time in the world's affairs and then withdraws again. The presence of God in the tabernacle suggested God's continued presence. The Israelites looked at the tabernacle and were assured that God was eternally present with them. Wherever they went, God was with them. He went with them. Human beings today in, in our world they have this idea that they can survive life by their own strength. Israel knew they could not cope with the dangers of the wilderness without divine help. Each time they looked at the tabernacle, they were comforted to know that God lived with them. And try as we might, we cannot survive in today's world without God's help. We need the Lord who is beyond ourselves. Secondly, the tabernacle teaches the precepts of God. The construction of the tabernacle involved intensive preparation. And those who are reading the Bible reading plan will have read these scriptures. The construction, which is Exodus 38, 36, sorry, 8 to 38. And then we have the making of the mercy seat. You can read Exodus 36, 8 to 38 yourself. It's quite long. And for those who haven't read it, you can read it in your private time. I'm going to pick out some of these verses from these chapters uh, just to give you an idea and understanding of, of where we're going and what the tabernacle is all about. So you have Exodus 36, 8 to 36, or 8 to 38, sorry. And that's, that is uh, the construction Step by step, the people are told to do the work according to God's plan, according to God's pattern. Then we have 
the, the, the furnishings. We have the making of the mercy seat. And I want us to, to read that. Uh, Exodus 37, 1 to 9. Then Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits was its length. A cubit and a half its width and a cubit and a half its height. He overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside and made a molding of gold all around it. And he cast for it four rings of gold to be set in its four corners, two rings on one side and two rings on the other side of it. He made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And he put the poles into the rings uh, at the side of the ark to bear the ark. He also made the mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits was its length and a cubit and a half its width. He made two cherubim of beaten gold. He made them of one piece at the two ends of the mercy seat. One cherub at one end on this side and the other cherub at the other end of that side. He made the cherubim at the two ends of one piece with the mercy seat. The cherubim spread out their wings above and covered the mercy seat with their wings. They faced one another the faces of the cherubim were toward the mercy seat. Then we have the make of the table for the showbread. Verses 10 to 16. He made the table of acacia wood. Two cubits was its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold and made a moulding of gold all around it. Also, he made a frame of a handbreadth all around it and made a moulding of gold for the frame all around it. And he cast for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that were at its four legs. The rings were close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And he made the poles of acacia wood to bear the table and overlaid them with gold. He made of pure gold the utensils which were on the table, its dishes, its cups, its bowls and its pitchers for pouring. Then you have the making of the golden lampstand. He also made the lampstand of pure gold. Of hammered work he made the lampstand, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and its flowers were of the same piece. And six branches came out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. There were three bowls made like almond blossoms on one branch, with an ornament knob and a flower and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental, ornamental knob and a flower. And so for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself were four bowls made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. There was a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under, under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches extending from it. Their knobs and their branches were of one piece. All of it was one hammered piece of pure gold. And he made its seven lamps, its wicks, trimmers, and its trays of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold he made it with all its utensils. So you have the, the lampstand. Then you have the making of the altar. The altar of incense in verses 25 to 28. 
He made the incense altar of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit and its width a cubit. It was square and two cubits was its height. Its horns were of one piece with it. And he overlaid it with pure gold, its top, its sides all around and its horns. He also made for it a molding of gold all around. He made two rings of gold for it under its moldings by its two corners on both sides as holders for the poles with which to bear it. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. The preparation of the incense was also there. And you have that in verses, chapter 37, 29. You have the building, I'll read that verse actually, uh, 29, he also made the holy anointing oil and pure incense of sweet spices according to the work of the perfumer. You have the making of the, the, the lava. You have the building of the altar. The actual build of the altar is recorded in, in verses, uh, chapter 38, verses 1 to 7. You have the, the making of the lava, verse Eight, you have the erection of the court, and that's um, 38 verses 9 to 20. Then you can go on to read the sewing of the priest's garments, that's in Exodus 39, 1 to 31. You have the blessings of the people for their work, and that's chapter 39, 32 to 43. You have the locations of the furnishings in their places. And that's chapter 40, verses 1 to 33. And you have the filling of the tabernacle with God's glory. And I actually want us to read that. Uh, Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 to 38. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Another important truth that emerges about the tabernacle is that God gave detailed directions and specifications for its construction. And that's what we've been reading through, uh, and I've given you the scriptures for that. Now, this was because the Lord would use the tabernacle to teach his precepts. We, too, must listen carefully to the instructions of the Lord. Another important truth emerges about the tabernacle's construction, and it's the obedience of the people. Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded. And that was in Exodus 35, 4. So from that point onward, until the end of Exodus, the reader is amazed to discover the verbs that depict the obedience of the people to the precepts of God. And for those who've been reading the Bible reading plan, you see the detail. God chooses highly skilled people to work on all the various aspects, using their gifts, 
using their talents, and they did everything in obedience to God's plan and pattern. They were obedient. They didn't think of, oh, oh, I think I'll add a bit of this here and a bit of that there. Their thoughts did not come into it. Their opinions and their personal giftings, uh, their abilities was not there to be exhibited. It was to obey the word of the Lord, obey the pattern and the plan that God had laid. And as you read these scriptures, you, you discover the verbs that, that, that show the obedience of the people, their obedience to the precepts, precept upon precept. Everything that God said, they did according to the plan and the pattern. We need to understand that the only way to survive in today's world is to discover God's will and determine to obey him. We cannot deviate. The third thing is the tabernacle utilises the priests of God. And attention is given in Exodus to the priest who were to minister at the tabernacle. And we see the whole chapter 29 is devoted to their ordination. Chapter 39 is devoted to the priestly dress. You see, the, the elaborate construction of the priest recorded in Exodus, and it might cause us to think that it doesn't apply to us, but it does. Before the priest could be involved in service for God, there had to be ceremonial washing. There had to be robing and anointing. They were necessary. And that suggests that before one can minister, one must, must first have in one's life the experience through which he ought to lead others. There must be the inward cleansing. It's absolutely necessary. There's a process that you have to go through. You don't just arrive there overnight. There's so many people who want to be leaders or who feel they can lead better than other people, who aspire to leadership. And they want to get there all hot and sweaty, just like that. It doesn't work like that. There must be that inward cleansing. Sin must be dealt with. Preparation. You know, as we've been going through Exodus, we've seen that Moses, he was brought up in Egypt. In our Bible study around the table on Thursday, we've been looking at it. Moses had to go through a process. Yes, he was born for a purpose. And we, we, we learn of how he was born. We learn how his parents kept him as long as they could. But at three months, they had to push him out. His mum had to build that little ark, that basket, and pitched it and pushed him out onto the Nile. But God had everything set up. Moses was found by Pharaoh's daughter. She took him. She, she made him the son of Pharaoh's daughter. She adopted him, as it were. But in those earlier years, his mother reared him, brought him up, nurtured him. He was given back to her, and she was paid wages to raise her own son. But in raising him, she instilled in her son the laws of God, the, 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 the ways of the Hebrew people. Nothing was written down, but the traditions were passed down, who God was, what, what the promises that were given to Abraham was. It was inside of him. So when at his age he, gave, he was given back to um, Pharaoh's daughter to continue his education and to grow and develop and reach manhood in the courts of Pharaoh, it was as if in, in Egypt, he was being prepared to become the leader of the Egyptians. But that was not God's plan for him. He was an Israelite. He was born from the Hebrew people. Inside of him was the plan and purpose of God. Inside of him, God was doing a work. And so you, you see one day he was out overseeing and he saw an Egyptian uh, brutalized, as it were, a Hebrew slave. And he identified with the Hebrew slave. And he went, 
and actually killed the Egyptian, not knowing that anyone had seen. The next day, he saw two men out uh, working and fighting, two Hebrew men. He went to break that up, and it revealed that they, someone had seen and spoken about what he had done. Now, God was preparing Moses for a task. He had to flee from his life because when Pharaoh heard, Pharaoh was coming after to destroy him. He would have died. He flew, fled to Midian and he spent 40 years in Midian. So in Midian, he became a shepherd in the backside of the desert. But God was preparing him for the task for which he was born. There was a time of preparation. God had to deal with Moses. He had to deal with him from the inside out. God had to transform him. It was a process that he went through. And the timing was God's timing. We need to understand that God is a time factor. And if God has called you, whatever he's called you to, he is preparing you. And it has to start from the inward cleansing. That is absolutely necessary. And then it's manifest on the outside. The next thing we realise is that priests had a variety of functions. They offered sacrifices. They made various offerings for the people. They burned incense and related God's word. And regardless of what they did, they did it all to glorify God and to help people. I want us to understand today that every Christian is a priest before God. I want us to read Revelations chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. We've been called to be kings and priests. Every Christian is a priest before God. And we have to allow God to do his perfect work within us. Survival in today's world depends on Christians being priests. We need to help others. And we need the help given to us by others. We face survival in an alien world. Like Israel of old, we need to discover the worship of God. When we walk with him, hallelujah, we discover his presence, he will, his will for our lives and his task for our lives. We need to understand that. We need to walk with him. We need to practice his presence. As we walk with him, one day at a time, oh, he will reveal his will for our lives. Hallelujah. We will discover his presence. We will know what it's like to be in the presence of God. We will know the presence of God. It'll be a natural thing to us. And as we're in his presence, he'll unfold his will for our lives and his task for us. When Moses entered into the presence of God, he was told to take off his shoes. He was told to reverence God. As he saw that burning bush, he was, said, he was told to take off his shoes for the place where you're standing is holy. And as he was in that place with God, focused on God, God revealed his will for his life to him. God revealed to him the task for which he was born. We need to know that God dwells within us. His presence is always with us. Wherever you see you, that's where God is. If you are a child of God, 
And as God dwells inside of you, he will prepare you from the inside out. No matter what you go through, no matter what you face, because God's presence is with you, his Holy Spirit lives within you. Just as those people, as they came out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness when they saw that cloud by day, a pillar of cloud by day, and they saw the pillar of fire by night. They knew the presence of God was there, but then God located himself in the tabernacle. He told them how to build the tabernacle. It was beautiful. However they looked, whatever direction they were in, when they saw the tabernacle, they knew God's presence was with them. And that was their survival kit. Knowing that God's presence was with, was with them. Hallelujah. We've got that same survival kick today. God's presence is with us. He dwells within us. We have his Holy Spirit. He's made everything possible. We can be everything that God has called us to be. Understand that God tabernacles with his people. He's in us. Hallelujah. And he will never, ever leave us. As I end, as I close this, the songwriter says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his will, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. I want us to understand as I close right now, it's not about your dreams and your desires and doing things the way you want and manipulating people and manipulating situations to get what you want. It's about God tabernacling with his people. It's about God's presence being with us and he is the one who will direct. He is the one who will make the opportunities. He's the one that opens up the way. He's the one that prepares us. We've got to be willing to take time to be holy. We've got to be willing to be obedient to everything that God says just as those people who worked upon the tabernacle followed the instructions obeyed the pattern that God had laid today right now in our homes God is calling for us to trust him and obey him and follow his order because we know he tabernacles with his people. Amen. Equipping the saints, reaching the lost, WWMF. We invite you in, we welcome you in, WWMF. Equipping the saints, reaching the Lord.